Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you again to our Sunday morning service. Uh, my hope is that maybe you've gathered with some other people, maybe your family, uh, or invited some friends over for a time of fellowship and um, be mindful of the restrictions of meeting size, but also an opportunity then to gather again around the Word and to fellowship and to be encouraged. My prayer is that uh, you wouldn't find this to be overwhelming during this time. Uh, it's putting me into a new place of having to discover how to manage using distance and how to do sermons in a way that I've never done it before. So. Uh, thank you for your patience as we continue in this process of discovering how we can still serve, gather together, and hear from His Word during this time. My, my thought is, as we are coming together, if, you know, question whether or not you've noticed any changes in the world lately. Obviously, uh, you'd have to be living under a rock if you didn't uh, know that there was some significantly different things going on in the world uh, this time. As you watch the news, you may hear of governments, Healthcare providers, businesses, schools, community organizations, all doing things that you thought you'd never see or hear about in our country. It's a startling new time for us, and as we look at the world today, it is important to note that God has said in His Word what our response is to be to, to the challenges that we face. We are continuing on in our study of First Peter, so I'd ask you to open up your Bibles and follow along as I read. I was uh, informed that sometimes I go a little too, too quickly in reading the passage before uh, as not letting people find it. So if, if uh, that's the case for you, I'm going to go a little bit slower. If you're, if you're fast at it, uh, be patient with me. I'm going to take a little bit more time. So 1 Peter chapter 4, and today we're going to read verses 7 through 11. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Are you there yet? Verse 7. Now the end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded, clear-headed, and disciplined for prayer. I, wanna, I want us to look at those first eight words for a moment. Now the end of all things is near. Now Peter wrote this nearly 2,000 years ago. He was aware that in God's timing, we simply can't look at what is happening in the world with any other conviction. We are to be constantly living with the mindset that the end is near. Jesus spoke to his disciples as they were curious in Matthew chapter 24. They were curious about what it would look like, Matthew 24. What would be the signs of that time? Matthew chapter 24, and we'll pick up in verses verse 3, and we'll read through verse 8. Matthew 24, verses 3 to 8. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately and said, Tell us, when will all these things happen, and what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Then Jesus replied to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. You are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, because these things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these events are the beginning of the birth pains. Jesus' disciples are curious. You're probably curious as well as what is it going to be like when the end of the age comes. And Jesus describes some things that are precursors to his return. False teachers and doctrines will be a part of the church, quote-unquote, church experience. There are today numerous false teachers and doctrines that are a part of this time. And Jesus predicted it. In fact, the first thing that Jesus tells them to be aware of is that they are not to be deceived. The enemy works with deception. He is a liar and the father of lies. Deception is the tool of Satan to lead people towards himself and away from God. He mentions wars and rumors of wars. This is definitely a reality in our world today. But Jesus says, don't be alarmed. This is important for the church. It, it shouldn't startle us 
nor surprise us that there are wars. As much as we would love to have world peace with no war and conflict, this isn't going to be a reality as long as sin reigns in the world. And that will be the condition of the world until the Lord returns and sets up his kingdom here. The end isn't coming just because we see wars and rumors of wars. Jesus says these things must take place. This is not the end of all things yet. In verse 7, Jesus gives us a list of some other things that will be markers of his imminent return. Famines, epidemics, and earthquakes. In the last several months, we've seen all of these. Famine is often brought on by drought. In Australia, we recently saw how drought can also bring catastrophic fires. Epidemics are a little self-explanatory as we're sitting in our homes watching a sermon because of the epidemic we're experiencing with COVID-19. Earthquakes are on the rise. Even eight days ago, there was a 5.7 magnitude earthquake in Utah that saw the quote-unquote angel Morani on the top of the Mormon tabernacle lose his trumpet. In their mythology, Morani is the one who gave the golden tablets to Joseph Smith for their false belief system. Look at Luke chapter 12 with me. Another opportunity to discover what Jesus has said. Luke chapter 12. Luke 12 and verse 40. You also be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Jesus tells us to be ready. In verse 36, just up from that, he says, You must be like people waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet, so that when he comes and he knocks, they can open the door for him at once. Jesus tells us to be like one waiting for their master. In 1 Peter 4, 7, in the first part of that, Peter is simply telling his re readers that the end is near and we should always act like it is. And he gives us a short list of what our behavior is to be as we wait, patiently, anticipating. Turn back to 1 Peter chapter 4 again, and let's read the second half of that verse 7. 1 Peter 4, verse 7 in the second half. Here's what we need to be doing because the end of all things is near. Be clear-headed and disciplined for prayer. Be clear-headed and disciplined in prayer. That's the first thing he tells us to do. The end of all things is near, so what do we need to do? Pray. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Many of you may be familiar with this particular section of the scripture, but you may have only read verse 14. But I want us to step back one moment and look at verse 13 as well. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. If I close the sky so there is no rain, or if I command the grasshopper to consume the land, or if I send pestilence or plague on my people, and my people who are called by name, my name humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal the land. God is telling his people that he will send drought, locusts, and pestilence. The fires in Australia were directly linked to the drought that had been experienced in that area. In Africa, on Thursday of this week, there was yet another report of locusts wreaking havoc in Somalia, and you can see many reports of, of uh, locusts in Africa right now. And like we've already identified, we're currently dealing with pestilence, a plague. The one thing that God instructs his people to do when they see all of this is what? Pray. The word translated in 1 Peter chapter 4, clear-headed, the, the word that's translated clear-headed is the Greek word sophroneo, we find this same word used in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. First and Second Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we'll look at verse 7. Are they yet? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, 
but one of power, love, and sound judgment. Here it's translated sound judgment. We are observing the world chaos. And when we observe this world chaos, we are to be clear-headed, having sound judgment and a sound mind. We've not been given a spirit of fear in times like these or any other time. We have power that the world does not understand, and we are to face the challenges of the end of all things with the confidence that comes through faith in Jesus. We can trust him, and he commands us to pray so that we may see healing for our land. Have, have you ever thought about that? Does our land need healing? And I don't just mean physically. Obviously, there are many who are in, that, in the throes of the COVID-19 virus, but so many people need spiritual healing. What a great time for us to cry out to the Lord for them. How often do we say, we need to pray more, and we don't? At times like these, we need to be in prayer. And the question would be, how is your prayer life going? As you have time away from your regular work or school schedule, you may have more downtime. A good way to address your prayer life to be disciplined in your prayer life, like Peter tells us, is to decide what you're going to pray about. What if you made a list of items and people that needed praying for and distributed them over a week-long schedule? Monday, I'm praying for my family, both near and far. Tuesday, I'm going to pray for my co-workers. Wednesday, I'm going to pray for the governments, the city, provincial and federal, and the world, and, and so on. As you design your prayer schedule, don't worry about it being perfect or up to someone else's standard. Peter tells us that we need to be clear-headed and disciplined when we pray. Nothing speaks to being in that kind of mindset more than having a plan. The first thing that Peter tells us to do when we see the things that indicate that the end is near is we need to pray. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells us also, to be persistent in our prayer. Look at Luke chapter 18 with me. And we'll, we'll begin in verse 1. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. He then told him a parable, them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not become discouraged. There was a judge in one town who didn't fear God or respect man. And a widow in that town kept coming to him, saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or respect man, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay to help them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of, God, Son of Man comes, will he find that faith on earth? Being persistent in prayer, clear-headed and disciplined, is a command of God. And Jesus asks if he is going to find faith on the earth when he comes. And what is this measuring stick of faith in this passage? Prayer. Will he find us persistent, clear-headed, and disciplined in prayer? My prayer for you is that he will find you as this kind of faithful Christian when he comes again. May it be soon. Lord Jesus, come. Let's turn back then to 1 Peter and chapter 4 and look at verse 8. 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep your love for one another at full strength, since love covers a multitude of sins. The second thing that he tells us we need to do is to maintain an intense love for, other, for, for one another. The end of every, all things is near. Pray and keep loving. Now, love is demonstrated in several ways. One way uh, love is expressed is obviously physical touch. Uh, can't do that right now to those who are outside of our dwellings. Uh, you could possibly touch elbows or, or something like that, but no greeting one another with a holy kiss. Another way of expressing love is words of encouragement. 
Many people are facing difficult times and they need to hear from you. I know that many of us have forgone actually calling people to sending messages. We, we text them and we email them. I'd like to encourage you to call. It's so good to hear your voice. Are words that are often said when someone calls with a timely word. We need to show love for one another by bringing words of encouragement. Another way love is expressed is helps. Are there ways that you can help those that are in need? Someone may need someone to get go get groceries for them. Someone may need someone to pick up prescriptions for them. How can we help one another during times like this? Another way love is expressed is with gifts. When we give of ourselves or give money or time, it is an act of our love. And God tells us that we need to keep our love for one another at full strength. It shouldn't be diminishing in its, in it, in its expression of, because of our social distancing and our inability to meet together. Another way that love is expressed is with quality time. As you call one another, spend time on FaceTime or other face-to-face -face apps, you are allowing others to know that they are important enough to take time out for. Our love is to be at full strength and expressed in its many forms to one another, even with the difficulties we are facing. Peter tells us that love covers a multitude, a multitude of sins. He is saying that forgiveness is necessary as an expression of our love for one another. I remember when the planes hit the World Trade Center in New York City. There were people around the world that began to call family members, even ones they hadn't spoken to for a long time because of challenges in their relationship, and they wanted to reconnect. They began to reflect on the new reality of the world in which they were living. There are no guarantees for tomorrow. Have you reconciled with your family, your Christian brothers and sisters, your co-workers, etc.? We are to be living as if the end of all things is near. And I believe we are close. And we are to keep short accounts. In that passage of Scripture, often called the love passage, or the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, turn there with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and, and let's hear what the Holy Spirit has led Paul to write about the description of what love is. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we'll pick up in verse 1. If I speak the languages of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I'm a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be burned, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Then he goes on to describe love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It is not boastful. It's not conceited. Does not act improperly. It is not selfish. Is not provoked. Does not keep a record of wrongs. Finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for languages, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see indistinctly, as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, as I am fully known. Now these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. God uses Paul to help us realize what, mean, what it means to have our love at full strength, doing everything in love. Love keeps no records of wrongs and, therefore, covers over the trespasses of others. Even in the prayer that Jesus gave us as the model prayer, he says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In verse 9 of 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter goes on to say that we need to be hospitable to one another without complaining. We are to be serving one another without complaining. There are many motivations for complaining. 
You may think that the person doesn't really need help. You may determine that they should be doing something themselves and are maybe even being lazy. This shouldn't be our approach. Obviously, there are times that this is a reality, but we are to overcome our tendency to complain by acknowledging the privilege that we have to serve. In Matthew chapter 20, it says that Jesus did not come to serve, to, to be served, excuse me. He says, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus modeled what it means to be a servant. And he had a lot on his mind when he told his disciples this. He just told them. In verses 18 and 19 of Matthew chapter 20, Listen, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified, and he will be resurrected on the third day. Sounds like a lot on his mind. He didn't let the stress of knowing he was going to die stop him from serving. What excuse are you using? Jesus modeled what it means to surrender your will to the Father. We need to be serving without complaining, and if we're not able to help, we can help find someone who is. As Peter ended this section of chapter 4, uh, 10, verses 10 and 11, he says, Based on the gift they have received, everyone should use it to serve others as good managers of the very grace of God. If anyone speaks, his speech should be like the oracles of God. If anyone serves, his service should be from the strength God provides, so that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Peter then outlines what God has done to make your serving possible. He gifted you with abilities. According to this passage, he did this so that you can serve others. It was the motivation he had for giving it to you. He wants us to be a good steward or manager of the abilities, talents, and gifts that he has given us. One of the things I often hear in church life is, that's not my gifting. So many people come to a place in their Christian walk that serving isn't what they really want to do. Another sign-up sheet at the back of the church? <sighs> nah, someone else can do it. Another event at the church? Nah, I'm really stressed now. Another need for someone in the church? Nah, I gave last time. Sound familiar? We've all done it sometime. God has gifted you with abilities and he has gifted his church with you. I want to repeat that. God has gifted you with abilities, and he has gifted his church with you. You are a gift to the church of Jesus Christ. So how are you managing the gifts that he has given you? As we struggle with discovering how we can, quote, quote unquote, do church in these days, it isn't a time for you to sit back and wait for someone to figure it out. It's time for you to step forward and do what you can do. Can, fi can you fix cars? Have you made yourself available for that? Can you paint, paint, repair things around the house, electrical, plumbing, concrete, shingles, gardening, sewing, etc.? There are people who are losing their jobs all around us. They're going to need someone to help them, both inside the church and outside. Find a way to serve those in need without complaining and know the joy of being Jesus' hands and feet to a world that is afraid and lost, to his people who are struggling to make ends meet. The attitude our service is to be like we are an extension of Jesus in this world. Speak the words God would have you to speak. Serve in his strength and keep up the good work. Peter ends with a short doxology or praise of God. This is an ancient tradition that we find throughout the Bible, sometimes in prayers and sometimes in proclamations to the people. I want us to look at a longer one that David gave in the prayer he did after he had raised significant amounts of money for the building of the temple. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 29 with me. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And we'll pick up in verse 10. 1 Chronicles 29, being in verse 10. 
Then David praised the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. David said, May you be praised, Lord God of our father Israel, from eternity to eternity. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty, for everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over it. Riches and honor come from you, and you are ruler of everything. In your hand are power and might, and it is, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. David acknowledged that everything they had given came from God, and God is worthy to give it back to him. All the gifts and abilities, finance and in, finances and intelligence are a gift from him. He is worthy for you to give it back to him. Peter tells us to be disciplined in prayer. Paul reminds us that, that God's will is that we would pray without ceasing. Jesus said to keep coming to him in prayer and be faithful in this. Make a plan for how you're going to pray. As you go through your day, you can pray. But make time for specifically focusing on God, his mighty acts, his amazing grace, and bring your petitions and prayers to him for yourself, for those you know, for people you hear about on the news or from friends, and be faithful in this. What's going to be your plan? We are to love. No greater love has any man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Call and encourage. Spend time together. Hugs to those that are in your house until all this social distancing is done. Give of yourself and your resources, your time, and help those in need. We are to show love and to serve without complaining. If you find yourself complaining, take a moment and ask yourself why you're not happy to serve. Ask the Lord to help you understand how to be a cheerful giver and a cheerful server. Manage the gifts God has given you well by using them to serve others. Last week I said, we don't know what the future holds, and I reminded you that we never have. God holds the future in His hands. Press into Him more for your strength. Press into Him more for your wisdom. Press into Him more for the power necessary to face whatever is going to be before us. Remain faithful in serving, giving, loving, and praying. None of those sh should stop because we can't gather together on Sunday. This coming Wednesday, we will gather as a church virtually. I will send you an email with the link for the Zoom meeting. And if you don't have Zoom on your phone or iPad or computer, then download it before Wednesday and join us. If you're watching this video and you would like to join us, but you've never received an email from our church, then please contact me at pastor at faithsaskatoon.ca. My email address is pastor at faithsaskatoon, all one word, dot ca. And make sure that I have your email address so that I can include it in our group email with this link for our Zoom meeting. It will be a time for us to share prayer requests, stories of what God is doing during this time, and to have a short devotional. It will be Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., and I hope you'll join us. I miss seeing all of you in person. And now I'm finished with my quarantine, but there are still restrictions for gathering sizes. I would encourage you to continue to find ways to connect safely with others. May God find us faithful as we continue to pray, as we continue to love, as we continue to serve and honor our glorious King. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we look into your word, you have been plain. You've made it very obvious that we need to be faithful, to serve without complaining in the strength that you've given to us, that, that we need to be praying and to be faithful and disciplined, to have a plan. Lord, I pray that you would give us your wisdom as we seek to understand exactly how, in our own circumstances, we can do this more and more. Lord, we do want you to find us faithful when you return, and we know that that day is upon us. The end is near, even as Peter has said. Lord, I pray that you would encourage your church, that those who are sick would be uh, finding healing physically, for those that are facing financial challenges with uh, layoffs, I ask God that you give them wisdom, that you would give us also an opportunity to help, and uh, Lord, that you would provide the resources. You own the cattle on a thousand hills, and you own the hills as well, and uh, you, know, you have the resources, and may we turn to you during these times. Lord, I pray that you would bless your church, cause your face to shine upon us, and give us your peace, both now and forevermore, to you be the glory in your church.
We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us today. And uh, I ask that uh, you continue to pray for your leadership in your church, that we would have wisdom. And uh, we are meeting right now and have been meeting, um, and we will continue to do so. And we will also have probably a congregational meeting coming soon, and we will let you know all the details of that. Please, again, email me if I don't have your email address and you are, are listening to this and you've never received an email from us, then you're not on our list. So we want to include you in that. And so please email me at pastor at faithsaskatoon.ca. God bless.